Good afternoon. This is Schweitzer, and this is a preview chapter on states of matter for AP chemistry. So this is just some you may or may not know much of anything about states of matter, but we've already covered a chapter on bonding, and we want to look ahead to see how this might affect states of matter. So you could call this chapter states of matter, or you could call it application of bonding theories in states of matter. So we're going to take what we learned in bonding and we want to apply that to in this case we would do states of matter. So as to whether something is a solid, liquid, or a gas. This particular slide is going to be dealing with solids. So as we've discussed in bonding, there are a few different types of solids. We have ionic, I have covalent, um, network covalent, and then we also have metallic. which we'll wait till the end of the year really to do much with. Uh, we don't cover a lot, but a couple of problems in the AP exam are looking at it a little bit as of the new curriculum, so um, we may tack a few things on towards the end. These two, uh, well, ionic is you know basically fundamentally different, but there are some changes here. One, you should note that as far as solids are concerned, ionics are always solid. Network covalent would always be solid, and we'd be looking at uh, very high melting points why we learned that last chapter why ion compounds have high melting points and we learned why uh, network covalence these are um, both of these would really be a bulk crystal as opposed to here we have a molecule okay um, all right so this is basically what we got here um, this is going to bulk together uh, all the stuff we did and, and essentially at this point we're going to look at uh, discriminating between different types of substances and why one may be have a higher melting point than others. So we um, might look at let's say carbon versus um, which is a diamond form versus NaCl versus let's say um, um, carbon disulfide um, versus let's say um, H2O. So for this uh, particular substance, uh, particular chapter, we learned that the pieces of it, and now we're going to apply it to discriminate between these guys and think which one's which. Um, here we have uh, a situation where we have network covalent, we have ionic uh, carbon disulfide. Um, in this case, it could be just simply covalent. Um, and then, of course, we have covalent here. So now we discriminate between the types of bonding, then we say, okay, well, we have two of them here that have um, both the same type of bonding. Is there anything that different between these that might make one different than the other? And in this case, we would have, say, okay, well, this guy has hydrogen bonding. So we have essentially a um, few different types of bonds, and then we have um, the intermolecular forces going along with those. Uh, at this point, you should be quite familiar with, with this. We have um, ionic bonds. We have network covalent. This is the highest. Um, these are all, I would say, um, sort of on a bulk crystal level. Then we have um, the intermolecular forces. So this is can't be intermolecular because they are bulk crystal. Then you have, at this point, intermolecular, we have van der Waals, or I should say we'll go with uh, London Forces, another name, London Forces, and L van der Waals is another name for that. And then we have um, hydrogen bonding, and we have um, dipole, dipole. Now, these things 
are generic names. This is this is a generic name. This is like buying, um, you know, a Kleenex when really it's a tissue. There's the, there's, a, there's a very specific name. This is a generic name. You buy a tissue. This is a, a general name for something for blowing your nose. That's this. This is a generic name for anything with a dipole. I'll try to do another thing with a dipole. You could, for example, have a dipole ion charge. This would be a dipole attracting to an ion. And that's a very, very strong attraction as well. So these are the ones that actually have actual names to them. This is more of a generic version. Um, this is a more specific version. We have three atoms that are very highly electronegative that, electronegative that work real well with with uh, these two guys. And of course, it's all been dealt with in the previous chapter, but nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Bound to a hydrogen will make it a hydrogen bond. There are factors that affect London forces. You should be aware of that. Um, some calculations that we'll use for this chapter. Um, Whenever we look at uh, mathematics, we're looking for somebody to mathematically describe a solid. So if we had, for example, um, just a maybe a heterogeneous pile of stuff here versus, let's say, let's see, you have all these things in here. And you say, okay, well, what's the, what's the composition of this thing? All different things. We could use a percent by mass. And in a homogeneous mixture is just one that's going to kind of look the same, where no matter what's in here, it's all kind of the same all the way through. So in a heterogeneous mixture, you might grab a chunk and get a certain amount of stuff, you know, and then you have another chunk and you might get different things. So that's not as easy to predict what you're going to get because it's so mixed up and maybe not random, in random, random, but here you pick it up and you're going to have the same stuff no matter really what you're getting. So when we, when we deal with these calculations, we're generally dealing with something that is consistent throughout the solution. Um, and I could be dealing with a percent by mass, um, which is going to be mass of individual pieces divided by the total mass times 100. So that's my general formula. Again, I could do it on, a, on a macro level, which would be, you know, the whole solution as a, as a whole. Um, Maybe that might work better for here. How many axes for total solution, total, total solid? Either way, we could have things in here. Um, maybe it's, you get it homogeneous. Maybe there's some stuff in there, but you just can't tell. Either way, it's on a, it's on a, a large basis as opposed to, let's say, a micro version, which might say, okay, if we took some of this stuff, what's the actual composition of that particular piece right there? Um, so I could take a look at it on a big point of view, or I could take a bit of a smaller point of view. So here's an example of that. I, I use liquids, but um, I guess I could take uh, maybe a solid here. Let's take a let's take a candy bar for example. We get ourselves one of my favorite candy bars might be a Snickers. So what's the composition of a Snickers? Okay, well it's percent by mass, which is usually how they actually list the ingredients is by percent by mass. The ones with the highest percent mass are listed first. So the first ingredient might be sugar, just straight sugar. Um, and then the next one might be, let's say, peanuts. And then might be, you know, milk, chocolate or milk if they don't already list it. And then you have all this stuff here. So on a macro level, I might say I take all the ingredients and say, what is the percent mass of sugar of all the ingredients? Uh, percent mass of sugar so would be the sugar mass divided by the total mass of the candy bar times 100. And you'd be able to get a percentage 
of mass for that particular item. And then we could look at, again, this is a max or a macro view. Now, a micro view might be something where you say, okay, well, one of these ingredients is sugar. What's the composition of sugar? So, okay, oh, well, it's table sugar, so that's sucrose. And it is C12H22O11. And you can say, well, all of the sugar molecules, which are, let's say this is a sugar molecule right here, and there's another one here, another one here. If I grab that guy, okay, they all would be the same. Um, so either way, it would be how much carbon is in that particular sucrose. So the mass of the carbon divided by the total mass of the entire molecule. So that'd be the basically the C uh, over the uh, there's 12 of them over the C12H22O11, and that's uh, the total masses of these two guys, and then times 100, and, and then you'd be able to run that through. And we got some examples of that, so some things you should be able be able to do. Okay, um, liquids, a thing or two should know liquids. Um, so liquids would be uh, ionic network covalent they would be out at this point so I would not expect NaCl to be a liquid except at very high temperatures um, so looking at possibly a covalent substance with a moderate amount of intermolecular force IMFs um, so we're talking you know some amount of these but not too much too much IMFs we become a solid uh, not enough IMFs we are a gas uh, so there's a small window, and we have a triple phase diagram we're using honors chemistry to sort of describe this, and everyone looks a little different, but solid liquid gas, and we have pressure, and we have temperature, and it shows the combination of these two things that eventually get you in the place of being a liquid. Um, so in this case, uh, covalent compounds with some intermolecular forces. Of course, um, if it is a liquid, there are there there's internal factors as to why, which would be like the bonding aspect of it. And then there's external factors, which are things that we can control, which are temperature and uh, technically pressure, but really, uh, it's either one. Temperature is more of a factor than pressure, but um, either way. Uh, and some math involving liquids. A unique property of math of so liquids that they do dissolve very well, and we think of them as being dissolving. And you take a substance, and let's say sugar, we take that sugar we talked about earlier, and we dissolve it in water. Take the sugar out of a candy bar, dissolve it in water. Well, now this thing dissolves into that item. First question might be why. Second question might be, okay, how much? quantity. The Y has to do with Coulomb's Law. I'm not going to say anything else about that. Think about Coulomb's Law and you'd use Coulomb's Law to describe why something would dissolve to a solvent. And quantity, okay, so we have essentially molarity, which is something last year, moles of solute divided by liters of solution. Capital M. There we go. Um, one little quick thing is how do you make how to make a solution? There's two ways. We got our solvent. And we take our substance we dump in here. And if this substance has to be a solid, then you would figure out molarity equals moles per liter, and you'd figure out the you have the volume here, and you'd have your moles of stuff you drop it in. You just divide the two to get your proportion. Of course, this is just a, a linear proportion. We, we'll talk about that a lot. Or you could take a liquid and pour this guy in here. In that case, a, you have liquid inside of a liquid. We call this a dilution. And then we'd use the formula M1V1 equals M2V2. 
So two ways to make a solution. Dissolve a solid in a liquid or a liquid in a liquid. Um, back to, let's go back to liquid, see if there's anything I missed there here. Um, again, internal factors, external factors. Uh, and of course, these external factors are the same for solids. Temperature and pressure is the same for solids. They have, as it affects solids, it affects liquids. Gases are the one word slightly different. The factors that affect gases, we have internal factors and we have external. Uh, the external factors that we can control are temperature, pressure, and the other one would be the volume. The volume can change, so that's a changeable factor, or as opposed to with liquids and solids, the, the volume's constant. It's not going to be compressed or changing. Internal factors uh, would, again, be bonding, but for something that is an ideal gas, I mean, there are no uh, inter inter interactions. So there are, in this case, no I, M, F. So of course there's no ionic and there's no network covalent, but there's no intermolecular forces either. Each piece is on its own. Um, in this case, we simply have things flying around. Um, we have basically, uh, one way I describe this is by the container that's used to the control that we have a uh, a rigid container. We have a balloon and we have a piston. And piston just gets shoved down. And compresses the area. So in this case, rigid container, the volume is constant. And here the pressure is constant and here the, the temperature doesn't have to be constant but I, I'm going to say the temperature is constant. So in this case rigid container I have, again temperature you should be aware of is just movement. Pressure would be essentially is like collisions. And every time a particle hits a wall is a collision. The collision uh, creates a force over a certain area and a force per area uh, is the exact definition of pressure. Um, the more collisions you have, the more pressure. More collisions per given area, more pressure. If you increase the area, then there's be the same number of collisions in a larger area, less pressure. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about this. But um, what I want to just kind of Look at this here, collisions here inside this wall, the balloon can start to expand. Uh, here as I push the volume down smaller and smaller, we have less area, so more collisions per given area means the pressure goes up. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of just a real preview. preview. And we got, um, uh, in this case, gas calculations. There are two main ones. Uh, PV equals NRT pivnert. Uh, these units are very specific. This is a liter. This is a uh, 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 pressure is not a liter. Pressure would be let's say ATM. If you use ATMs, then this has to be 0.0821. If you use a MMHG, then this has to be um, 62.4. Uh, this would be a liter. This is moles. And this is Kelvin. All right. Um, the other one is the main other main calculation here would be uh, combined gas law P one V one over T one equals P two V two over T two. Main thing here is you have consistent with your units across it. Solve for the missing variable, and these guys have to be in Kelvin. Um, that's because they cannot be in, they have to be in an absolute value, uh, meaning that there's no negative number uh, unit. So, all right, thank you very much.